Thank you for listening to NSL Double Talk. Never stop, stop, stop learning. At Never Stop Learning, we connect you with engaging experts who join you and your friends or colleagues in conversation at a location of your choosing. With NSL Double Talk, we are bringing the Never Stop Learning model directly to you. Each podcast will feature two experts in conversation on topics that range from global affairs to wellness to arts to innovation. Sometimes the experts agree, sometimes they don't, but we will never stop learning and never stop laughing. Espanol. In Espanol. <laughs> NSL Double Talk featuring Lisa Soto and Eric Friedberg. Their topic today is cybersecurity. Should we be concerned? Lisa has been named among the National Law Journal's 100 Most Influential Lawyers, and she chairs Hunton's top-ranked global privacy and cybersecurity practice. Lisa serves as the chairperson of the Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee. She is the editor and lead author of the Privacy and Cybersecurity Law Deskbook. Eric has over 30 years of public and private sector experience in law, cybercrime response, IT security, forensics, investigations, and e-discovery. He has helped many Fortune 500 companies improve their governance and technology initiatives. We are so excited to welcome Lisa and Eric to NSL Double Talk. Let's deviate just for a minute to talk a little bit about the legal regime in the United States and and abroad as well. Um, I think the fragmented nature of the law of data security and cybersecurity really has created an incredibly ripe environment for attackers. So we have at best a patchwork quilt of regulation on data security in, in the United States. I mentioned the data breach notification laws. That probably is the most important corpus of law that has shifted did the landscape, not because it requires certain levels of security, but because it embarrasses companies, because there is that need to essentially stand on your roof and raise the red flag if you've had a data security event. So that's been a very important body of law to shift the security trend within companies. But we also have both laws at the federal level and the state level. It's really a mess of a legal environment out there. And industry standards have therefore filled the gap. When we started our company 15 years ago, it was very hard to get the attention of companies to do proactive cybersecurity work. And then what happened is there was all these class actions that happened as a result of data breaches and regulatory fines. And it was really that pressure that drove a lot of quote unquote voluntary compliance where Boards became very cognizant of the liability. They became very cognizant of their reputational risk. And they started to embrace putting in a comprehensive program. So those factors, although there's not a normative standard in the U.S. of what thou shalt do from a cybersecurity perspective, there was enough pressure from the regulatory scheme and the enforcement action and the litigation, that it really started to move the needle in the U.S. And I think that that probably the same thing is going to happen in Europe, that you're no longer going to be able to not pay attention to this area or to not focus on events when they happen necessarily as robustly as you otherwise might. When you have a major financial institution or a top Fortune 10 company, They have taken this so seriously for such a long time that these schemas don't really create a lot of incremental work for them. It creates some, but they're already so compliant and so well-funded and organized and they truly care about this area. What I'm seeing is that these regulations are going to hit mid-sized companies way harder. They're very expensive to comply with. They don't have the kind of resources and they haven't thought things through. When we talk about how you get ahead of the curve here, which I think is possible, and I've seen lots of companies get ahead of the curve and increase their cyber maturity very significantly. One of the first starting points is, what security standard am I going to adopt? And at what level of maturity am I going to shoot for given the threat landscape, given what I do as a business, given my particular threat history. Obviously, financial firms and defense contractors, 
and critical infrastructure companies, they have to basically shoot for the top rating on all these categories in cyber. But certain other companies don't. Uh, but if you haven't started that conversation at the board level on your C-suite with your CISO to figure out how secure do I want to be? Do I want to be able to fend off state-sponsored attackers? Or do I want just moderate security that's more fitting to the fact that I don't have a lot of personal data, for example, as a business, or that I haven't have a, I don't have a big attack history. It's not an easy calculus, but unless you start that conversation, it's hard to make progress. Absolutely. And it's an interesting thing because we've been preaching to the choir, you and I both, for years on cybersecurity preparedness. And it's really only around the 2013-2014 time period that boards got religion on this. And why? Because the Target incident was the first time a CEO resigned, at least in part, as a result of a cybersecurity incident. And then we saw a spate of resignations that followed. So that's where boards and senior executives really start to think hard about this issue. We are, we are seeing real threats um, to the positions of the folks in the senior roles at these companies as a result of cyber risk. Let's talk a little bit about the timeline of a data breach, of a compromise? How do these things happen? How does, um, what's the arc of a breach? Well, typically you learn of a breach in a number of ways. Sometimes the more serious breaches where a state-sponsored entity has attacked you, the government literally just comes over to your business, knocks on your door and uh, says, uh, we have some bad news and we have some bad news. And they tell you, look, you've got a problem. It's coming from such and such an IP address typically don't give you a ton of information, but tell you you're under attack. And they give you some identifiers typically, and they say this is what you should start looking at, and the investigation starts from there. A lot of times the company's own security department figures out that they're under attack because they have all sorts of tools that send off alarms, and somebody notices that one of the alarms went off, and an investigation starts from there. Sometimes an outside security researcher has found something and approaches the company and says, I've noticed, especially in the area of misconfigured servers, they'll say, I noticed that such and such an S3 bucket with all this data of yours is unencrypted and open on the internet. And then an investigation sometimes happens that way. And I think it's really important to note that something like 40% of incidents are actually identified from the outside. So we only find anomalies in our system or issues ourselves only about 60% of the time. And we are looking to external parties to let us know that other percentage, very significant percentage of the time. And so once that happens, however it happens, where you get a notification and your internal investigation uh, kicks off, one of the challenges is it's very hard to figure out in a short amount of time what has happened. I can't tell you how many times that people have spoken too quickly about what they thought the extent of the unauthorized access was, and then they have to go revise it a week later or two weeks later. And that often, well, sometimes that's understandable, sometimes it's not, and you have to be very careful about what you say. And there's really not that much you can say because, for example, Let's say an attacker comes in and has hopped around from server to server to server to server. We see often 20 to 50 hops before they get to the mother load of information that they're looking for, personally identifying information, healthcare information, et cetera. You raise some great points. When we see a very significant uh, issue in a company, the first thing that we as counsel will do is recommend retaining an external forensic investigator. And of course, the reason for that is that the forensic investigation firms that do this all the time have seen thousands of these events, and they really know where to look in systems to identify the issue. They're much more uh, conversant than internal uh, IT departments are when finding these sorts of issues. We used to have the luxury of time 
So we used to be able to conduct a forensic investigation over the course of two, three, four months. And then only at the end of that period, when we had fairly good certainty as to the course of events, did we go out live. We are now under enormous pressure to announce earlier, not only because of legal requirements, but also because of social media pressure. The blogosphere has gone crazy on these issues. So if we don't announce an issue within a very short period of time, you can bet somebody else is going to announce it for you and frame it for you, and then you will have lost the opportunity to frame the issue for yourself. Uh, and I'll, I'll just note here that the communications that we issue in terms of, of breach notification, these are not shoot from the hip sort of communications. They are loaded with legally required content. So they're uh, often less friendly than we would like them to be, less consumer oriented, and they must contain certain legally required uh, sentences and, and various other content. So we are, we're working hard to, during that period when you might be doing the forensic investigation, we're working hard to put together the required communications. And they need to, uh, to tick all kinds of boxes on the legal front. And then we have to try to make them actually uh, speak to the, to the individual recipient of these communications. If you have not rehearsed that in advance, through what we call a tabletop scenario, it's really difficult to make those calls and pull your team together when you're under attack and expect that it's going to uh, not give somebody a lot of gray hair. You know? Absolutely. <laughs>